Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is RET 120 Hydraulics. So I would like to start early with a discussion about industrial safety. So uh, hydraulic systems use confined fluid under pressure to perform an enormous amount of work. And you need to be aware that sometimes hazardous conditions exist. The, I'm not discouraging you from working on these things because these hazards can be mitigated with appropriate procedures and personal protective equipment. So that's what we're going to discuss about right now is personal protective equipment. First up is our head protection and you will typically, especially in the wind turbine industry, you are going to be see people wearing hard hats. Obviously these are designed to protect people from head injuries. The first one on the left there, that is a type one. It's known as a type one. All it does is prevent impacts from the top of the head. The type two, however, you notice immediately it's got a brim to it that protects from impacts from the side of the head as well. Also, it serves a dual purpose if you're working outside, sometimes help out with the shade. I had one of those. I highly recommend you get one of those too. Okay, there's three classes of hard hats that you'll typically find. So there's a type and a class. So our class G, that's typically what you get. They're general use. They can protect up to 2,200 volts or 2.2 kilovolts if you prefer. And there's a class E that's known as an electrically protective um, helmet could protect up to 20,000 high voltage protection. Uh, class C is a conductive helmet. Now you may ask why on earth would I ever want a conductive helmet? Well, the answer is what if you worked in the metal industry? Uh, basically you're smelting a lot of metal, high temperature metal splattering out these plastic hard hats would be eaten up in a second in an environment such as that. So some people use uh, metal hard hats still. So basically the molten metal doesn't melt through it. Okay, uh, the next one is our eye protection. So we went over our head protection. Next one is our eye protection. The standard uh, that governs this is the ANSI Z87.1. And by the way, the head protection is ANSI Z89.1. So all safety glasses that you use should be covered under ANSI Z87.1. They have to be approved. Same thing with our head protection. Make sure that you're getting the correct pieces of equipment. They are guaranteed to perform in the environment that you're going to be entering. First one is our safety glasses with side shields. These are these guys right here. We'll be using those in our labs. Everybody should be using them. And the reason why we use these things, again, we're a fluid power systems. There could be pinhole leaks, an object could enter the eye. Um, if you're using a pneumatic system, which is one of our types of fluid power systems there, could uh, imagine high pressure air, you know, a hose whip if you ever used a, uh, a nail gun before, you know, uncontrolled removable hose, the hose could fly out and hit you in the face. And where's it gonna hit you? It's gonna hit you right in the eye, okay? Uh, our next class is our goggles, and those are designed to be worn over prescription glasses. This guy here serves the advantage that people without glasses can wear it, people with glasses can wear it. The last one here is our face shield. So the face shield is for some pretty heavy, dirty environments. The classic example is, is anyone's ever used an angle grinder with a cutting wheel attachment, you definitely want a face shield. As a matter of fact, you might want a face shield with a goggles and safety glasses with side shields and there's still going to be particles that find your way to your eye so uh one of the other concerns is to if you are working in such an environment where it's dirty and there's a lot of potential hazards you want to make sure that there's an eye wash station nearby so an eye wash station is something immediately available that in case you do get something in your eye you can go ahead and run to it pull the chain and basically it's going to flush out some water and hopefully flush the object out of your eye. Okay, the next one is our hand protection. And again, choose the right glove for the right situation. Are you dealing with chemical exposure, you know, an acid or something like that? Make sure you get acid protective gloves. If you're working with a base, would you use acid protective gloves? No, you wouldn't use a base protective glove. So make sure you're using the appropriate material. The other one is our physical hazards, cuts and abrasions. Typically, you're going to be climbing up a tower, incredibly, incredibly high heights, uh, for if you're a wind turbine technician, 
one of the gloves that they issue is basically a leather glove with an internal membrane that is either a wire mesh or a Kevlar. So in the event that you fall, if you grab on, which is a normal human reaction to grab onto something as you fall, um, your hands aren't cut up by the ladder on the way down or the rope or whatever you're grabbing. So you are hooked up with fall protective devices, but those gloves are designed to protect you from cutting your hands. The other thing is, is using your hands every single day on rough, in a rough environment, you know, you may make sure you want to go ahead and protect them. The other thing is, is make sure those gloves are incredibly snug fitting because you don't want to have an incredibly large glove and get it caught in something. Okay, our protective clothing, make sure that your clothing is tough enough. Make sure it's got chemically resistant if you're working in a chemically caustic environment. And the most important one, flammability. We are in the power generation business. And again, we're going to be around electricity and electronics. And sometimes there may be a fire. You want to make sure that you're not wearing anything that's flammable or that can be melt that will melt to you when it is on fire. So make sure you're wearing clothing that does not burn. Okay, our hearing protection. Sometimes we find ourselves in some pretty noisy environments, especially with hydraulics. The valves are incredibly noisy, believe it or not. You'll see it in labs. Uh, it's just part of the nature of the beast, okay? So that's why we use earplugs and earmuffs. And again, an earplug is a soft moldable device that fits inside the ear. You know, squish it down, stick it in your ear, and it expands back to that shape. Whereas an earmuff, it's an over-the-ear device. Okay, each one of these has a noise reduction rating. Basically, that's the amount of reduction in decibels, which is the unit you measure sound. So let's say a noise is 30 decibels that you want to protect yourself from, and an earplug has a noise reduction rating of 10 decibels, so you would be exposed to 20 decibels of noise. Whereas, let's say this has a 20 decibel noise reduction rating, that same 30 decibel noise, you would only be exposed to 10 decibels of it. Okay, so OSHA has what they call an eight hour time weighted average of 85 decibels. Now, this means, again, over eight hours, you can't be exposed to more than an average of 85 decibels. But let's just say there is an incredibly loud noise that only occurs once every shift or once every hour, whatever, there's a basically, you are allowed to do that. A brief exposure to higher sound levels f is permitted, okay? Or longer exposure to less noise, okay? So it's, again, it's an average. Okay, uh, the last one of our personal protective equipment that we want to discuss in this class is our foot protection. What covers this is the ANSI Z41, and Typically, you're going to be wearing steel-toed boots as a wind turbine technician. And additionally, if you are going to be working around hydraulics and a lot of oil, you should have oil-resistant soles and leather. Basically, it's something that's not destroyed by hydraulic oil. And additionally, the soles provide the added advantage of not being as slippery. They're still slippery, but not as slippery as a, slippery as a traditional sole. Okay, the next topic that we want to discuss is lockout and tagout. Okay, so lockout and tagout are two incredibly important procedures designed to keep you safe. Okay, the whole purpose of them is to prevent equipment operation during inspection, maintenance, and repair. I.e., you wouldn't stick your head inside an industrial blender if you're making if you didn't make sure it was off and no one else had the means of starting it up while your head's in there. Okay, so there's two different types, lockout and tagout. They're totally different things, and you need to be aware of the distinctions between them. First one is our lockout. It's the use of locks, chains, or other devices to prevent the startup and operation of equipment. It prevents the startup. Okay, so the lockout station that you see right here has a bunch of locks and some hasps and some tags, which we'll go back into. This is a lockout device. This particular one is a lockout device for a valve. There's a number of different types of lockout devices. Basically, they're lightweight enclosures used to lock out a standard control device. This one's a valve, it's pretty standard. What you do 
you put over the valve, so basically you're removing stored energy, you know, turning off the system, whatever it is, you're locking it out so no one else can start up that system, release that hazardous energy, which may be on one side or the other of that valve. You're protecting it so the system downstream of it is protected. Okay, so that's one lock. What we have right here is a hasp that allows multiple people to perform, put locks on there if they're all performing maintenance on the same system. So again, if you've got a number of people performing maintenance on the same system, each individual has a lock. So that way, if the owner of this lock walks away and someone's still working on it, you know, they, that person, the owner of that lock could in theory remove it and start up the system. You don't want to have that happen. That's why you use something like this, where you have everybody has a lock, they all lock it out. Everybody has to pull their lock off the system for it to start back up again. Okay. The second form is tagout. A tagout, as the name implies, is a danger tag attached to a source of power indicating that the equipment may not be operated until the tag is removed. That's this, it's just the tag. No locks, no enclosures, no chains, or anything like that. It's just telling somebody to not start it up. Okay, so this is the important distinction. Tag out does not prevent the start of equipment, but serves as a warning to operating and service personnel. Whereas a lockout does prevent the machine from being started. Okay, ideally, in every situation, you should be able to use a lockout, but sometimes you can't. Okay, so OSHA permits the use of tag out, which tells people do not operate this piece of equipment. So a lockout and a tag out, notice here. So we've got a lockout with a tag out. Tag out accompanies lockout. Telling someone this is locked out by who, such and such a date, when it's going to be removed. Okay? Whereas tag out by itself, it's just a warning. Okay, the last thing we want to talk about here is our sources of hazardous energy and safety concerns around hydraulics. Number one, high pressure fluids. Sometimes a pinhole leak might develop might be developed inside a hose. Never ever check for leaks using your hand. And how I use to to illustrate this example is this device down here is what's known as a water saw. That is using high pressure water to cut through steel. Seriously, look it up on YouTube. These things exist. Pretty amazing to see. That's exactly what a pinhole leak would be like in a hydraulic system. High pressure fluid shooting out in an incredibly small opening. It's a water saw. If you run your hands along that, be prepared to have a couple less fingers, okay? The other thing is, do you really want hydraulic fluid mixing with your bodily fluids? No, you don't. It's incredibly poisonous. So be aware of pinhole leaks. Uh, catastrophic and spontaneous rupture, ruptures, i.e. explosions, you know, uh, you're dealing with a confined fluid being, be it water, or excuse me, be it a hydraulic system or air in the case of pneumatics, be aware that these things can rupture. Again, ideally you're not going to be doing that and you're properly maintaining the system so you're incapable of bringing it over pressure. Okay, suspended loads, especially for those individuals who work on hydraulics with cranes and wind turbines. Suspended loads. Be aware that a suspended load may require hydraulic pressure to keep it suspended. So when you remove that hydraulic pressure, when you're trying to disable a system or whatever to perform some inets on it, be aware that a suspended load may be requiring that pressure to lift it. So always block out or block out, you know, basically a suspended car, you're having jacks underneath it, solid jacks, so it doesn't fall when the hydraulic system is below it or lower the load. Okay, high temperatures sometimes, especially failed uh, hydraulic systems, they're generating a lot of heat. Don't just lay your hand on a valve because they might be incredibly hot. Moving actuators. Uh, be aware that an a cylinder is extending and you might be in the limits of its travel. Um, you guys are going to be exposed to what's known as a hydraulic tensioner, hydraulic wrench. It's actually using hydraulic pressure 
to go ahead and torque a bolt sound, make sure your fingers are not in between the the uh, reaction arm and the wall of the turbine, because that's what it's using to perform a base against. The other thing is hydraulic versus pneumatic actuators. Hydraulics, slow and steady. Pneumatic actuators, use of air. Basically, those things move incredibly, incredibly fast. So if you are a hydraulics expert, you've been working on hydraulics for 10, system, for 10 years, you, work to a, you move over to a company that's working with pneumatics, be aware that they don't act the same act incredibly fast. Basically, pressure rises and rises and rises. There's no movement until it gets to a certain point, and then bam, it snaps open or closed, whatever it might be. Okay, uh, Stored hydraulic energy in the form of accumulators. We're going to be going over this a lot because this is a very, very important topic. An accumulator is a hydraulic energy storage device, and it's used for a number of purposes. One of those purposes might be for loss of power, it serves as an emergency backup. So in the loss of hydraulic power, an accumulator serves as a stored source of energy. So if you're working on a system with, a, with an accumulator that is there for that purpose, let's say you've disabled the pump, you said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and work on this system, not so fast, because there may be an accumulator that the pressure needs to be relieved from, okay? and one of the more common hazards, which you'll see in the lab, slippery fluids from leaks and spills. We're using hydraulic oil. It's incredibly slippery. Keep your workspace clean. Can't emphasize that point enough. Keep your workspace clean. Stay on top of the spills. Inform other people of the spills that might be around you. Okay? Um, the last one of the hazards, well, by no means the last and only, but one of the more common hazards you're going to find yourself around is electrical energy. Be aware that you have a hydraulic system that's performing a lot of work, but the control systems for these hydraulic systems are typically electrical, excuse me, electrically activated solenoids. So be aware that you're using a combination of hydraulic and electrical energy to perform work. And again, we're in the power generation business in renewable energy technology we are going to be around electricity a lot. This lecture is not designed to scare you, but it is designed to keep you aware of the safety concerns working around hydraulics and in industrial systems. And again, we discuss our source of hydraulic energy and safety concerns around hydraulics, lockout versus tagout, and some of the personal protective equipment typically found on a job.